I'm going to basically zoom out a bit from what Michael was telling and uh, reference to the research uh, that we're doing together with Michael and Chris, who will be speaking after me, and um, yes, uh, all the speakers in this session, in fact. Um, we've been uh, working on a crypto economics research roadmap. So the qu first question is, who is we? And how have we come to the conclusion to do such a thing? We started in Vienna. Um, we're, uh, I'm the director of the Crypto Economics Research Institute at the Vienna University of Economics. Uh, we started this research institute that is highly interdisciplinary uh, last year, beginning of last year, with some uh, very small funding. Um, and we have some core researchers that are project funded and some associated researchers um, who uh, have their own departments um, from, from eight different departments, uh, legal researchers, uh, economists, um, business, uh, computer science, and they sporadically work together with us on related questions. Um, we've started uh, this field building actually two, two years ago um, at our university, and um, and we we st uh, we did uh, and or we have a lot of ongoing projects. Um, uh, focusing on tokens as a main application and uh, working with governmental institutions, but also private corporations and blockchain startups. So, for example, tele, uh, T Labs in Berlin, they're funding our token economics research, basically blue sky research. They're really interested to understand uh, where this token space is going. Uh, with the city of Vienna, we're, for example, conducting a project where the city of Vienna wants to incentivize CO2 emission reduction by uh, providing uh, the citizens with tokens, which they can then um, um, uh, exchange for cultural activities. And we are advising them on the behavioral economic side of how to create this token incentive mechanism. Um, uh, we're working with the Austrian National Bank on tokenizing securities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are all a few examples of what we've been doing, and these projects have given us the, the possibility to scope the space and the relevant questions, and um, also find the partners we want to work with. Uh, on top of that, we've been conducting many events alone and with partners, um, conferences. Um, um, in Vienna, but also internationally, for, for example, the Token Engineering Global Gathering in Berlin uh, this summer, uh, we co-hosted and co-curated uh, one of the tracks, uh, and we also have some ongoing event series which are research-focused only and for the public. Why am I telling you all this? Because it was this kind of heuristic uh, one and a half years, two years of trying to scope the field, try to find partners, try to identify also the research uh, um, questions that are relevant uh, to us and also identify what we want to do. Um, and all these activities have led us to, for example, me and Chris to meet Michael and we're now collaborating on this crypto economics research roadmap. Uh, which we would, I would like to present today. Um, this research roadmap uh, sets a framework of how we want to conduct our research at our institute over the next few years. And hopefully it should also provide a, a framework uh, for you guys to see uh, whether you want to collaborate with us, uh, uh, but also independent of us, it could provide you a framework of how you want to approach crypto economics uh, research and uh, applied research projects. So our research roadmap builds on certain assumptions. Um, it builds on the assumption that blockchain networks uh, and, and related Web3 networks are in fact um, a new type of public infrastructure that is collectively maintained. And the mechanism, the crypto economic mechanism behind it, um, this is quite an interesting new type of value creation phenomena which, uh, which needs to be studied. Um, as, uh, as we just heard in, in the previous talk, these networks are complex socioeconomic systems. But the difference to the socioeconomic systems we know today from the analog world are nation states. Uh, these systems come with a rich and real-time data set, which means that given uh, the advances in data science, we can use um, much more sophisticated feedback loops to steer these systems, and we'll look at this. Um, tokens, and we assume that tokens as the atomic unit or also the killer application, to, to frame it in marketing terms, um, are the killer application of this new Web3, and um, which could eventually lead to the fact that we tokenize our whole socioeconomic activities. 
And if we do that, this will do something to our, uh, the dynamics of our economic systems. Um, all these things, all these um, assumptions uh, re require a research and they require interdisciplinary research. Now the question is why interdisciplinary? And I will take some time to really focus on that question because I think it's necessary uh, because uh, our research community in general uh, focuses more on single disciplines rather than interdisciplinary research. And I think um, this is not, uh, not we need to transcend this because especially uh, given the technology, the infrastructures we're dealing with today, uh, they require interdisciplinarity. Why? Uh, we believe that um, interdisciplinary research, and you can see, find this in literature, is, is appropriate. A, if the research uh, question is not confined to a single domain. And as Michael has pointed out, and Angela yesterday, and um, uh, Kevin, et cetera, et cetera, obviously this is a governance technology, and as such, it, it, it touches many disciplines. Um, interdisciplinary research is also appropriate if the subjects involve complex systems. Complex systems by nature uh, require interdisciplinary research. Uh, the process is often heuristic, iterative, and reflexive. And, and uh, the process we went through over the last two years, which I briefly described, um, is kind of a testament to that. Um, it, this type of research uh, draws on different disciplines. And what it does, it, it, try, it, it, it finds a space between the different <coughs> disciplines uh, to reconcile maybe or possibly conflicting insights and through a process what we call integration. Now interdisciplinary research uh, is um, often misunderstood. It really does not at all reject any type of uh, disciplinary research. Uh, it is in fact deeply rooted in disciplinary research, uh, but it offers a corrective. <coughs> and yeah, thank you. Thank you. So it offers a corrective because the disciplines are foundational to interdisciplinary research, but especially in the context of complex problems and complex systems, uh, we need uh, this uh, interdisciplinary approach. Um, and uh, in order to get to good answers, we need a combination of uh, kind of um, a symbiosis of disciplinary research and interdisciplinary research to have the depth and the breadth to answer the questions we need to answer. And M Michael has been um, outlining some of these questions. Now, why aren't we doing it? Because obviously it's, it's, there are quite some challenges to interdisciplinary research and Angela uh, outlined some of them yesterday, one of, uh, one of them being jargon. Um, we speak different languages across the different disciplines. This is why we cannot communicate with each other. And in fact, uh, Michael and I, we met uh, almost uh, a year ago in Berlin and um, we had no basis of communication, so we knew each other and we respected the fact that the other one was in the room, but we, we couldn't communicate. And thanks uh, for Chris, uh, who is our math guy on our team, uh, and uh, meeting up and interacting over other subjects. Uh, at some point, a few months ago, we realized that we're talking about the same thing, but he thinks in mathematical functions, and I, I, I use words. And... Um, <laughs> and um, and in fact, um, uh, the overlap of how we think is like we really think and, and see everything in the same um, way, but uh, we didn't have the same jargon, we didn't have the same vocabulary, and we didn't have the same methods to approach the research. So this is obviously a great challenge that we need to overcome uh, systematically before we can do interdisciplinary research, and I'll explain how we want to do this. Um, and then there is always disciplinary bias that you can only overcome if you, that's, that's a mental process to overcome this. Um, either you want to overcome it or not. Um, now there is a, a set of methods that we can use to approach interdisciplinary research. The first thing, and, and we've been doing that over the last few few years and also all the research that, for example, Michael and I've been doing prior um, to the last few years, you need to identify the relevant disciplines, but that's not enough. Once you have that, you need to map the research questions to you have to the disciplinary parts of those disciplines. So what could be relevant? And then obviously you don't want to be all over the place because there is a limited bandwidth of things you can do at the same time. Uh, and probably you have limited time and budget. So um, you need to reduce the number of potentially relevant disciplines to the, uh, the research questions um, 
you want to answer, you, you need a phase of reconciliation to limit what you're looking at. And probably what we've seen with us is you need to be a bit pragmatic of who, who's there to work with you, right? Um, um, you need to work with the people who have the right mindset uh, and, um, and then you work with the discipline they know. Um, what you need to do once you've defined all that, really to conduct systematic literature review. What has been already been written, we don't want to reinvent the wheel and it's really not necessary. There is a bandwidth of academic, not only literature, bodies of knowledge in different domains. I didn't know about control theory at all before I met Michael. I didn't know that we had all these tools to do the things that I wanted to do. So, um, um, and, uh, but then once you know that there is this body of literature, you need to study it. Um, you, and then you develop adequate relevant disciplines. Um, <clears throat> uh, you go into the analysis phase and, and the result is integrating these insights to create a common ground uh, from which different disciplines can start off uh, doing their common research. Um, now, Interdisciplinary research differs from transdisciplinary research and multidisciplinary research. For example, transdisciplinary research focuses more on similarities of methods in different uh, disciplines, whereas interdisciplinary research has a research questions and tries to find methods from different disciplines and then integrate it. Um, I'm not saying up, it's probably all three trans, uh, interdisciplinary, and uh, multidisciplinary research are probably relevant to cryptoeconomics, but we're focusing more um, on the interdisciplinary part of it right now. But this is for sure one of the research questions also that could be relevant to um, our roadmap. Now, uh, we've seen the slide uh, on uh, Michael's uh, presentation as well. So uh, the first thing that we identified that we're dealing with systems, uh, in fact, complex socioeconomic systems. These blockchain systems are complex socioeconomic systems that come with this um, real-time data set. Um, why do we need to define this? Because, um, or why is uh, interdisciplinary Interdisciplinarity matters in, in the space between engineering and economics, something that Michael also outlined before, because what we want to do is what, having these complex socioeconomic systems that come with a real-time uh, real data set, we can now combine economic methods and engineering methods to uh, create something we call economic systems engineering. And the purpose of this is to develop rigorous engineering tools uh, to build these um, economic, the, this economic incentive layer to steer the networks, to create these governance, automated governance mechanisms. Um, and we need to do that, especially we need to bring more engineering ethics into, um, and uh, ethics and practices into a steering of these networks, because these networks are in fact mission critical and safety critical systems. And uh, we don't, currently, um, we're not treating them as such. We're building blockchain networks like Ethereum, like we're building websites in the 90s. It's a quick and dirty attitude of, let's build something and we're not even testing it, and we might have a mainnet, uh, a test net before, but then we go live. And the problem is that it comes with an inbuilt economic incentive layer. So uh, the collateral damage is high when something goes wrong, and we saw it in the Dow, we saw it with the multi-sig disasters um, um, after some um, ICOs, people lost hundreds of millions, um, and it's ba basically also because we're not treating these systems like mission-critical systems, but we have the tools to do that if we combine engineering methods with economics. So why do we need to look at system theory? Because system theory gives us um, a framework um, to describe what is happening in these complex networks. Uh, systems, system theory gives us a framework to define and um, kind of describe the structure and the purpose and the functioning of these systems, including their spatial and temporal boundaries and the interdependencies of the system parts with each other, but also with the environment. And uh, we've not been doing that. Current engineering practices of blockchain networks don't do these things. Um, I'm going to skip that. Um, so the next thing we do um, is uh, systematic literature review. So I'm not going to reference to uh, control theory because uh, and cyber physical systems. We we've seen that already. Um, 
if we uh, con if we try to understand, like if we, we we describe these networks as complex adaptive networks, but we're not the first people to do that. In fact, if we go back in, ec in economic literature, we see that the likes like Eleanor Ostrom talking about public goods and common goods, uh, uh, defining the tragedy of the commons, they already talked about the complexities of these networks. Um, and it's also quite interesting, I find, that Eleanor Ostrom talked about polycentric governance, which is uh, basically a very good description of what blockchain networks do. Um, kind of some dis she called it polycentric governance, but it's uh, it's kind of distributed um, kind of control of networks basically. Um, we can see that uh, Friedrich Hayek and many of the Austrians, one of the things they did was they, they said that markets are complex systems that need spontaneous <laughs> order and not centralized control and. Um, um, and refer to the economic calculation problem, and we're seeing that we can reference back to what they wrote and, um, uh, and uh, build on a lot of the economic theories that uh, they, uh, they provided, but uh, the times have changed, and now we have this real-life data set to actually steer economies in a different way. And obviously, uh, um, uh, w when we talk about systems, there is general system theory, but of course cybernetics is a huge thing, and we're here at MIT, and we of, um, uh, mentioning Norbert uh, we, Wiener is, uh, I think, enough. What, uh, what Wiener brought us was kind of the notion of the feedback loops, and, and we can use feedback loops now to control these economic, socioeconomic systems. And obviously there is much more contemporary uh, research um, um, on market design or complexity economics, and um, if you're interested in that, once we have our research roadmap uh, finished uh, in a few weeks, uh, we're happy to share it with anyone who's interested and also get feedback from anyone who's interested, by the way. So approach me or Michael later. Um, Okay, I have to skip a few things, but I think one, one of the things that we did, uh, we, we said that ec economic system engineering, because it's interdisciplinary, we needed to identify the disciplines that are relevant, and we did that here. Obviously, systems engineering is a relevant discipline. Anything related to AI optimization and control theory is re are relevant disciplines. Computer science and cryptography are relevant disciplines, but also psychology, and decision science. Um, um, on the other hand, uh, political science and governance, um, philosophy and law, and uh, I'm sorry, I can't see anything without my, um, then game theory and uh, economics, but also operation research and management science. Uh, so these are the most important disciplines, and as you see, it's quite a lot. Um, Probably for the sake of our research roadmap, we will start to work on certain aspects of it and not on all aspects of it. But maybe together we can, we should be working on all aspects of it. So one of the things we've also done, or I did actually, um, uh, leading up to this research roadmap is I, I read, uh, wrote this book, Token Economy. I, I have a few copies with me here. It's, it's a non-academic book geared to a general audience, but writing this book really helped to scope the whole um, kind of uh, um, um, space of token economics and, and these systems that we're creating. And the perspective of this book is, it's always from the token perspective, explaining the technology and its networks from the token mechanisms, but also the applied tokens that build on top. Um, yes, and this is what we're also doing in our research institute. Where not doing all things blockchain, we're not really focusing on any type of federated blockchain solutions, supply chain questions, we're really focusing on this one atomic unit, the token, um, which, uh, we, which represents the local state of this, these economic systems and represent or can represent any type of goods uh, or access rights, um, physical or digital. And they're provable and they're durable and the existence of tokens is nothing new, but the fact that we can now tokenize all our social e economic activities, if that really happens, and we, we can already see the trajectory, it's ex also explained the use cases um, and the pervasiveness of it, it's explained in my book. Um, if we assume that we tokenize our whole economy, this will do something to the overall system dynamics. 
uh, of how we interact. And uh, how are we with time? All right, one minute. All right, maybe I would like to conclude with the uh, with this, um, talking about systems and applying system theory, we have two type of token systems. One token system is um, uh, simple token systems or complex token systems, uh, any type of asset or access rights. Uh, tokens that represent assets or access rights of our world today, uh, we consider them uh, as m predominantly simple token systems that can be um, tokenized, then the token is a cryptographic derivative of uh, kind of these uh, assets and access rights. And this requires mostly, not only, but mostly legal engineering. The question of how can I design this in a legally compliant way. Um, what we're focusing on in our research is more the complex token systems, tokens that steer networks, which I refer to uh, in my personal research and also in this book as uh, purpose-driven tokens. These purpose-driven tokens kind of uh, yeah, steer these networks, uh, the governance rules tied to them, steer networks and how we design them uh, is a very crucial question. And the initial conditions that you kind of, uh, the, the protocol or the uh, set out the initial conditions uh, really define for a very long time how these networks are steered. So we need to think about how we steer these networks before we put them into action, and uh, some of the work that uh, Michael is doing is very valuable. Creating these simulation tools gives us an opportunity to have a to simulate how something could pan out before we put it into praxis. Because uh, as we've seen from the Bitcoin or Ethereum community, uh, governance by fork is a kind, a kind of a tedious process. It can take years, uh, as we saw in the block size debate, and it leads to often multiple. Uh, splits in mu into multiple networks. And um, obviously you cannot forecast everything, but we, we can have better tools to simulate um, future outcomes. And Bitcoin was never built on those type of forecasting tools. So to conclude, I would like to say a great deal of our research builds on the notion of a purpose-driven token. Uh, the purpose-driven token is a, for a new form of collective value creation. It enables us to collectively contribute to a public infrastructure by incentivizing the individual. And this is in the absence of intermediaries. And we've never had that kind of tool before. Um, that doesn't mean um, that uh, there shouldn't be any human governance. There should be human governance feedback loops to upgrade the protocols. But there is a high degree of automation that is possible to steer the networks. And uh, this is a new form of value creation. And it needs. Um, um, it needs uh, a lot of research. So what is the roadmap of our upcoming research papers? And some of them we are already collaborating with people to work on it and for others uh, it would be great to find collaborators. First of all, we need to after, conduct systematic literature review on the questions and related disciplines uh, to, uh, as a base layer for further research. One thing we need to do, I'm very happy that um, this was mentioned yesterday, is to develop kind of a Rosetta Stone, uh, kind of uh, some vocabulary, a set of vac vocabularies across disciplines to be able to commonly understand each other. Uh, otherwise, we have no basis of working together. Um, we also need to identify challenges in interdisciplinary research in the context of blockchain systems, some of which were mentioned by, by Michael before. Uh, one of the questions that will be very relevant is how will the tokenization of goods and services affect the overall dynamics of our current economic systems? And will that go beyond the tokenized parts, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Uh, and. Um, Yes, you can uh, read, so purpose-driven tokens, a lot of research on that. Maybe to conclude, um, this economic system engineering in the context of, we need to look at it in the context of contract theory with economists, in the context of law uh, concerning incomplete contracts, but also in the context of political science regarding governance feedback loops, on-chain, off-chain governance, et cetera, et cetera, human feedback loops versus automated feedback loops. There are a lot of questions, um, and um, if you're interested to collaborate, please approach me or some of our other researchers. Thank you. <laughs>